Let me ask a couple of questions. Um, I won't embarrass you by looking for answers. Um, perhaps you can just raise your hands. Would that work? Okay. How many of you like to go out for a Friday night fish fry? Oh, ho, ho, ho. oh me too. <laughs> um, how many of you like to go shopping? Ladies? <laughs> Come on, guys, we do too. Just different places, right? Menards, Home Depot, <laughs> you know how that goes. How many of you like to go hunting or fishing or some other sport? Huh? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Now, let me ask you, in order to accomplish those things that you like and enjoy doing, what does it take? Huh? Well, it takes money. Of course it does. And what else does it take? It takes your time. If you're going to put your desires into action, hmm, you need to do something. You need to have something. A good number of years ago, I served a mission church in Lexington, Kentucky. After a potluck dinner, um, uh, one uh, Sunday after church, we had a potluck dinner, and, and part of the uh, idea was that we just didn't eat together, but that we had time after we ate, uh, not only to talk to those around us, but to share with the whole group, what are some of the things that have been a part of your life this past week, and, and, and you know, what are some of the joys and sorrows that you might want to share with the whole group? And I remember the one member who told us about her friend, Pat Tonin. She had written a book about her life, about growing up in the coal mines of Kentucky in the Depression, 1930s era. I want to read just a portion of that opening part of the book for you this morning, and then we'll talk about the parable, or I should say the miracle, <laughs> but it really is a parable too. Here's what she wrote. I was just 15 when the Great Depression swept over Kentucky and the whole nation. A lot of the coal mines had shut down, so my daddy and his brother and cousin Harold all went up to Cincinnati to find work. It had, if it hadn't been for the little bit that Mama made keeping house three days a week for the Delroy family, we would have had nothing but a few chickens that laid eggs and the squirrels and rabbits that my brothers shot. The Delroys were what you would consider rich back in those days. Mr. Delroy owned the only food store in town, and he had the only bank in the whole county. One night, Mama told me that the oldest Delroy girl was coming home to get married, and I was going to help with the wedding reception to serve all them folks that was coming to the wedding. Mama was really excited since she would be getting some extra money. And since I was helping out, the Delroys had agreed to give us some of the leftovers from that wedding banquet. Wow. Now, usually on the days when Mama worked for the Delroys, she would get to eat some of the food from the f noon meal that she fixed for them. But any leftovers, you know what they did? They threw those leftovers out to the dogs, the hunting dogs that Mr. Delroy kept. Now that did not set right with me. No, that was not right at all. Giving food, good food to the dogs when people was going hungry. Mama would have never allowed that. She had a big heart. And no matter how bad things were, Mama never failed to share with others. She was always sharing something with somebody, somewhere. Anyhow, the wedding day finally came. Mrs. Delroy had ordered them fancy black dresses and them fancy white little aprons that we wore as we not only prepared and got all ready, but served the people. That morning, we were up at 5 a.m. so as we could be at the Delroy's by 6 to start with all the wedding preparations. And wouldn't you know it, it was one of the hottest and muggiest days of the summer. Ah, my, what a wedding dinner it was, though. 
and watching all them folks eat, I was afraid there wouldn't be any leftovers. For nearly two hours they ate and drank and made toasts with champagne like I seen in the movies. Then I watched them push themselves back from the table and complain and how full they were. I got to thinking about the Phillips family. Their pa had gotten hurt at the mine and so he couldn't work no more. They hardly ever had more than one meal a day, much less three. And the widow Mavis, in her old age, she had no family left to care for her. She was skinny like a chicken and hardly had any food, except when mama and the church women would bring over from time to time some food for her. Well, that's when Mama nudged me from behind. She said, girl, don't you be standing there daydreaming. We got work to do. And I turned around and I just blurted it out to Mama. Mama, don't you never talk to me about Jesus feeding all them folks with loaves and fishes. All I see here is God feeding the rich and leaving the poor to their hunger. Child, don't you be talking that way. Your family needs this work, Mama whispered a little louder. I looked at her, and I could tell I'd said enough. We were there for nearly on to six o'clock that night when the last wedding guest left. The last thing we did was to crate up those leftovers that Mrs. Delroy had parted out for us to take. There was leftover ham, roast beef, mashed potatoes, those peas with the little onions in it, and even some wedding cake that we could enjoy for our supper just a little later. Mama said, Lordy, Lordy, we got enough food to last us two weeks. Well, I said, we earned every bite of it because I was looking forward to having some wedding cake, too. Mama put the leftovers in the boys' little red wagon as we headed home. The next thing I knowed, Mama was stopping. Right there where the Jackson family lived. She had done invited Milo and Harriet to come and have supper with us. Have supper with us? These were our leftovers, I told Mama. But Mama didn't say anything. She just looked at me, turned, and headed for home. When we got down the road, I tried to talk to Mama again, but she hushed me, saying, Eleanor, after supper, I want you to get out the Bible and read that story again, the story about the loaves and fish. And this time, you pay attention to what Jesus told them disciples. Later that night, after having a wonderful supper, I went to go to bed. And there, sitting on my quilt, was the Bible where Mama had placed it. So I started paging through it. I found a marker, and right there, the marker was at the story about the loaves and fish. And I read how Jesus had compassion and how the crowds were hungry and what he told the disciples. You give them something to eat. Oh, how those disciples must have grumbled and groaned when they thought they had to figure out how to feed all them folks. And then Jesus simply took the five loaves of bread and the two fish that they had. And soon everybody was eating. And not even eating, they had enough and they even had leftovers. In all those years since, I still remember what Jesus said. You give them something to eat. 
you give them something to eat. That's our gospel for today, too. Our gospel in which Jesus shows not only his compassion for the crowds as he healed the sick among them. It was late in the day. The disciples realized the crowds were hungry. So they tell Jesus to send them on their way to go get something to eat. Now, think about that for a moment. Here's 5,000 or more people, men, women, and children. And Jesus says, no, 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 wait a minute. You can't just send these folks into town to get something to eat. Think about it. If there were 5,000 or more people out here somewhere in the countryside listening to Jesus, and they all came to Westby to eat, Borgans couldn't handle them. The restaurant at the corner over there by 27 couldn't handle them. They'd go to Vroqua, and they couldn't handle them. They'd have to ship them back out to, well, that's too far to go. <laughs> It'd be morning by the time they, they got to eat. Can you imagine? And then can you imagine? Now, I don't know how this miracle would have happened. There are lots of theories about all of that. But it happened. Jesus took those five loaves and two fish, asked God's blessing on them, broke them, gave them to the disciples. And we're told they all ate and had their fill. And there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. You see, Jesus demonstrated to the disciples that if you have compassion, and if there is a need, and then you must act. Use the blessings you have and watch how God can make good use of them. You know, all too often, the worst that is spoken about the church is said and heard. But the best that ought to be said about the church too often isn't heard, much less spoken. I want to speak some of the best of the church this morning. For you see, you and I are part of that church. Not just here. Not just in this community. Or in this state. Or in our nation. But in our world as well. Together through our Evangelical Lutheran Church, you and I have continued to feed the hungry throughout the world, through our world hunger. In 2017, we will have $24 million that will feed hungry people. In other years, it was as high as 27, 28, 32 million was used to feed hungry people. You and I are a part of that good work. Now wait. I say that to encourage you not to give you a sense of pride or boastfulness, but a realization that we are continuing to do what Jesus said. You give them something to eat. And it isn't just food. In Africa, you and I, through our Evangelical Lutheran Church and through Lutheran World Relief and other agencies, we are providing clean water and clean wells for those who are thirsting and have no clean water. In Brazil, our Evangelical Lutheran Church has been active in rescuing children from the streets of the large cities. Children who have been abandoned or who are orphaned and have no place to call home and no one to call family anymore. We have provided not only food to feed them and clothing to help them, but an education so that they might better their lives. Some of you remember that a couple of years ago, Nepal had devastating earthquakes. People's homes were completely destroyed. They had no resources to rebuild or, or much less to find places to sleep and to have comfort in that climate. Guess who was there? Among the first, our Evangelical Lutheran Church along with Lutheran World Relief. 
And guess who's still there today, this very day, still helping people find ways to rebuild their homes and to find opportunity to renew their lives. You and I, through our Evangelical Lutheran Church, are there in action with our financial resources, with our prayers and our encouragement for those folks. Eight, eight or maybe more years ago, do you remember the earthquake in Haiti? My goodness, thousands of people dying, homes completely destroyed. Guess who was there with blankets and tents for home or shelter for those people? Guess who was there with clothing to give them something other than the dirty clothes that were left over from the hurricane? You and I, through our Evangelical Lutheran Church and our partner churches. It isn't just Lutherans, folks. It's Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterian, Church of God, Assembly of God. It's all of the Christians around our world who continue to do what Jesus asked us to do. You give them something when they are in need. Closer to home. Think about it. The food pantries. The places where people have an opportunity to be served a free meal through our disaster relief, whether it's around the world or in this country. We help people restore their lives. Whether it's the neighbors who help neighbors in the surrounding communities with the flood, or whether it's people who travel from northern Wisconsin down to New Orleans when the flooding happened there and the hurricane. It's all of us together. Whether it's prison ministries, nursing care facilities that we provide opportunities not only for care but for worship and so on. Whether it's supporting troubled individuals and families through Lutheran social services. We, the church, we are there. I'm not sure if you know, but one out of nearly 50 families in the United States, one out of every 50 has been touched by Lutheran social services around our country and around our world. You and I are a part of that as we help those people bring their lives back to a sense of order and hopefulness and a future that they need. And there's lots more. Folks, I, I, we'd be here until 6 tonight and I'd have to send you home to get something to eat. But most importantly, in all these ways, we are able to show and to share that love of God with our neighbors and with our friends and even strangers around the world. You and I are a part of that. We, by our giving of ourselves, our time, and our financial resources, we do it because we care about people. We do not need to know theological principles. We do not need to be biblical scholars. We do not need to understand how miracles happen. We need to know the words of Jesus. We need to know those words in our head and in our hearts. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And the good news is that that's what we are doing. And there's more that we can do. Not because we have to, but because God has blessed us. And we are able to share those blessings with others. You give them something to eat. Thanks be to God. Amen.